Uh, I hope everybody <coughs> enjoyed lunch. The um, We're talking about being comfortable in comfort zone. I just got an email from Bruce Whipple. He's going to send his regards. And, um, and he said for all the time he's been to the seminars since 1993, he says two things have stuck with him through his entire last 19-year career. Uh, and he says, I'm sure that you're slamming it home to the kids. Uh, and one is, um, you only will succeed to the level of your self-image, which is exactly true. No one in this room will exceed past their self-image of themselves. It is not possible. Yes? Do you build that in levels or you just go straight to the top? Well, I went straight to the top. Because when I was sitting in million dollar houses and Rolls Royces when I was 25 years old, I didn't sit in uh, BMWs with the greatest respect to the people that I used to know. Or I didn't sit, you know, uh, you know. Although I did own um, a Mercedes before uh, a, um, a Rolls Royce and I did have a Cadillac Eldorado. I went through 13, 11 cars in 13 months. 11 cars and 13 cars, which, which included um, uh, Lincoln Town Car, Cadillac, um, uh, two-door Cadillac, whatever you used to call them. Then I had a Fleetwood Brougham limo, I had an Eldorado convertible, I had a, uh, a, a, a two different Mercedes, uh, uh, and then ultimately I had a Rolls, all within the 13-month period uh, when I was... Uh, uh, 1972, I was 26 and a half, 26 and a half to 27 and a half, I had um, 11 cars in 13 months. So, um, because if, if, if you've never had that kind of stuff, you don't know the difference other than, you know, you don't know the difference between... Uh, $75,000 BMW and a $225,000 Rolls. You really don't, because you never had either. You were never had either. Uh, and uh, the cars weren't as expensive then. Of course, the dollar was a different thing. And uh, But see, I was telling somebody in Istanbul uh, a few weeks ago, I remember the month, the exact month I first made $10,000. October 1974, I made 10 grand. I remember it so vividly. I remember I went out and bought my first seersucker suit. You know what seersucker is? Seersucker, you know what it is? It's, okay, my first seersucker suit. A brown pinstripe seersucker suit. And I have a blue pinstripe Brooks Brothers seersucker suit I was just looking at uh, yesterday, the day before. And I remember like it was yesterday. Ten grand. Now, ten grand in 1974, uh, you know, doesn't sound like a lot of money to me now, but ten grand in 1974 was a lot of money. I remember the first month I made 30 grand. I still remember, and I remember what I did, and I still remember the first month I made 50 grand. I still remember the first month I made a million. I still remember the first month I made fucking 50 million, and it was sterling, not dollars. <clears throat> I mean, I can vividly, I can see how I went down to, you know, the, uh, wherever I was, I started the Brooks Brothers and then uh, Carroll and Company, which is a very expensive men's clothing place in Beverly Hills, and then ultimately Saville Road. And I first remember the first suit, bespoke suit. Bespoke means tailor. And the difference between a tailor-made and a handmade suit is handmade is stitched by hand. Okay? And when the buttons are like this, and see if you unbutton two buttons, that means fuck you. That means fuck you, two buttons unbuttoned. Because sometimes you can unbutton one button. And you know why the, the, the suits have buttons? I mean, what, what kind of fucking education you guys get? Okay, because when they were surgeons in the old days in London, they used to be able to roll up their sleeves and still operate, cut on the fucker. That's why there's buttons. Now most of you don't have buttons. Uh, this happens to be a Dunhill. This one, mm -hmm. yeah, Dunhill. But I remember all those days, 
and you know, with 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 great joy. You can tell in my voice. I remember when I remember I was saying this to my son Derek, at a, you know, and the first month. In fact, the people in Istanbul. I made ten grand in nineteen seventy four, and it was obvious they weren't making ten grand in nineteen seventy four. And the uh, although he's a very wealthy guy now, but I remember those things. I remember the first Rolls Royce I got. I mean. I was as proud as a peacock. I mean, you, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't get much higher off the ground than I was. And I wasn't on drugs. I remember the first time I was driving my 450 SL Mercedes convertible down the street, and uh, a couple of young girls drove up in a Chevy or something, and um, I'm driving to Newport Beach to the to, to the Newport Beach Yacht Club, and uh, then they didn't know that. And I'm all tan. And my back then I had more hair. My hair is blowing back like this and tan. And they look down and says, "How's the world?" And even though I was below them, they said, "How's the world up there?" I said, "Pretty fucking good, honey." <laughs> <laughs> Pretty fucking good. <laughs> I remember all those things. So when I when I, when I'm hoping and when I'm talking to Sally about you know helping you create those things for yourself, I've been there. You know. Uh, I've done all that stuff, and then because I've been on Wall Street and I've been in the, the hypocrisy of Wall Street, I understand all that as well. And because I used to sell life insurance and I used to sell real estate, and I've done a lot of things, all successfully, all successfully. Because once you get used to being successful, you you don't think of the fucking alternative. It doesn't even enter your little pea brain if you got a little pea brain, you know. Steve Jobs, God rest his soul. I mean, even though he was a tyrant, apparently a tyrant, and that when I did some stuff for uh, uh, Apple many years ago, he was a tyrant. He and now they talk about him like he's some sort of god. And he was an icon of business, no question about that. I mean, he didn't he didn't worry about the failures, and Apple certainly had a bunch of them because he focused on the ends, not the means, and he was comfortable. And he was obviously comfortable with, with, with the, as, as Napoleon Hill said, the magic of money consciousness. Although he didn't spend the money, he lived in a house that wasn't furnished till the day he died, fully furnished. So, the second thing that Bruce said is, says you'll only raise to the level of uh, you, uh, that you, you think you belong. The second thing is that um, that uh, you'll only be able to grow as you inspire others. Because you can't do it by yourself. You just can't. I don't care if you're the smartest guy that ever walked the face of the earth. You can't do it by yourself. You got to do it with others. One of the reasons that Marcus brought his brother and, and Mark is so that they, he could understand where he's coming from. And, and I know you think your brother's a little goofy. I understand that. Okay. Well, he is a little goofy. He's a little crazy. He actually, reminds me of myself when I was younger. You know. But and the people have been telling me I'm crazy for a long, long time. And, and you know, most people would be embarrassed. And if I was German, I wouldn't share the story that the team of the School of Business who I went to, the only difference that happened between 1971 and 1991 is Dan's accomplishments caught up with his big mouth. I remember telling that at the Siemens thing. You know, everybody flinched because that's not a story you would share, you know. Because, you know, and God, and I was going to say, God rest Klaus is so, and he's not dead. He's a very <laughs> successful guy. But, I mean, Klaus kind of held me in reverence. And so, and that's the way the Germans are, you know. That's where they got in trouble back in the 30s, okay. And so I respect that. But you need to think of yourself that way. And in, unless you think of yourself, you know, you're going to have trouble. And you can't do it by yourself. You have to do it with others. And that's why a team, no one person's perfect, and a team can come close to being perfect. And that's why these athletic dynasties like the Lakers, or maybe now the Miami Heat, and the Yankees, and these various sports dynasties, Real Madrid, and all these others, are so successful because they have inbred a lifestyle of success. You know, until recently, Lance Armstrong had that for, uh, uh, you know, bikes. You know, and now you know, I, feel, I feel bad about that. I already commented on that. That's a tragedy. Um, but you, and you, you don't get that hanging around with bums. And I'm not saying 
like you hang around with now. And I, you know, they're not bum. You, you, you don't, you don't on purpose hang around with bums. You don't. But you grow up with guys, you know girls and guys at school, and you know, they're your friends for 30, 40 years. Uh, and I have friends that we, we had dinner with uh, a few months ago uh, in Las Vegas, Sally and I, that I've known 50 years. Uh, and they're successful in their own rights. Uh, but, uh, you know, I see them once in a while. But you, you guys are no different than any other group that's come through here in, in the last almost 20 years. You have associations that you feel comfortable with, and the guy you went to school with you probably feel more comfortable with, or the girl you went to school with you feel more comfortable with. In some cases, you may feel comfortable with your cousins or your aunts or your uncles, which may not be high-performance people. It doesn't mean they're not good people. It doesn't mean you don't love them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you want to be a super high-performance person and you want to excel at the very top level, you've got to get around people that are fucking smart. Some of you, and you're not here to internet, or uh, network, internet. you're not here to network and swap business cards, that's not what this thing's all about. But there, you, you, there will be some friendships made and some ongoing business relationships, because at least you've got one thing in common. You understand what this is all about. Okay? And as I said yesterday, and, I'm, and I beat to death when we come to the last day, never again can you say you don't know how to fucking do it. You may, not, you may choose not to do it. God bless you. Buddha bless you. Allah bless you. Whoever wants to fucking bless you. But you can't ever say you don't know how to do it. You may have trouble, great difficulty, getting yourself comfortable with doing it because you've got to suck up your pantyhose and you've got to do things that are outside your comfort zone. And, you know, it's like my dad said, 1980 award, when I got that big award, all I know is he accomplishes without me and in spite of me. Your families can probably say, if they were honest with themselves, they could say the same thing. Very few, other than lovingness and nourishingness and nurturingness and all that stuff, which is all great shit. I mean, very few of our families and siblings and parents have anything to do with our success, other than they're supportive. The, the Williams sisters are a great example. They're supportive. They're supportive when they do things bad. My 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 dad was supportive of me, but not when I did something bad. You know, he'd give me a fucking beating when I was young to make sure I didn't do it again. And I, for the most part, I didn't do it again. But I got that kind of support. But you know, my parents didn't tell you you can do any, you can be anything you want, because that was beyond their comfort zone. My parents were civil servants. Okay?